Thank you very much, and, uh, and a warm welcome to everyone here on a pretty coolish uh, afternoon here in Geelong. Thank you very much for giving up your time to come along this afternoon. Uh, just a couple of uh, administrative issues first up. Uh, if you wouldn't mind just making sure your phones are on silent uh, so that we don't have any unfortunate calls. Um, another reminder is that uh, if for those building professionals here uh, who haven't registered for their CPD points. The forms are out the front. Don't forget to do that. Um, we will have a little giveaway at the end, which will include a copy of the presentations. There will be a little bit of a feedback form there that you can see, if you don't mind uh, filling that in at the end to give us some feedback on today's session. That would be appreciated. And what was also appreciated is that we did ask for small contribution uh, towards the Salvation Army Building Fund as part of uh, this seminar series. Uh, this is about the seventh or eighth that we've done around Australia. We've got a few more to go still. And um, uh, in total, we'll be raising more than $10,000 to uh, donate. So we're very pleased about that. Thank you very much. We'll be having some short questions uh, after each of the presentations, and then we'll have a, a, a lot of time, a lot more time at the end to have a, a good discussion about some of the issues that were raised. Look forward to that. Well... About four years ago, CSR embarked on a, on a very new, new journey, uh, and that journey was, was setting up an innovation team. Uh, I had uh, been the general manager of the Bradford Insulation Group. I was asked to set up a team. We have a structural engineer, a builder, building scientist, and mechanical engineer, and we were charged with trying to look at new ways and new, new, new issues for the building industry in Australia. The approach we took is to look at a whole of building approach where we base uh, the, the, the work we do on the principles of building science. Basically, we're looking to see how should buildings work, what is the best way to get the best outcomes and performance out of them. If that happened to involve our products, nice, but if even better, if we find that there are new products, new systems, to method, new methods that enable us to, to develop some innovations, whether they be systems or service provisions. So that's the brief that we've been looking at uh, across uh, all the, all the uh, construction industry. To better understand uh, what we were embarking on, we decided to build our own house. We built the CSR house uh, four years ago uh, on a vacant lot that we had next to our bricks factory in Sydney. And the objective of that was to try to better understand how our products all went together in the construction of, of a building, uh, how they integrated with other products, uh, and, and to understand uh, a bit more about, about the way that houses are put together and the issues for both designers and for builders uh, in the construction process. We spent a bit of time taking our staff through. They could educate them in terms of the building process. But one of the key issues was that we embarked also on a research project uh, and our program involves significant learnings that we've gathered from this process over the last few years, not just about residential construction, but applicable to non-residential construction as well. Today is about sharing with you some of those learnings. One of the main issues that arose during construction is we've had, about, we've had hundreds of builders and designers go through our CSR house in, in Sydney, uh, and most of them make a comment about how comfortable the house feels. And it, the feeling of it is significantly different when you walk in. Our research has been all around why. What is it that quantifies that? What is it that makes it different? We started a research by looking at where housing had been in Australia. This happens to be my grandfather's house. Uh, a little while ago, my cousin turned up and at a family function and said, oh, you're in the building game. Here's the plans of our grandfather's house. And I said, oh, terrific. And we had a look at it, and we did an energy star rating on it, which came out at zero. Uh, it's a weatherboard house with a tin roof, uh, obviously no insulation, wood-fired stove and wood-fired uh, he uh, heating in the, in the living and uh, dining area, uh, and on, uh, on some, some uh, a timber floor. The total energy load came out at 464 megajoules per square metre, uh, and predominantly this is a requirement for, for heating uh, at that time. This was an architect design house. In 1957, apparently, we, we found out only recently that CSR had built a, a, a CSR house 
in Sydney as, as well, not long after the war, trying to show off a whole range of new building products. This was slightly better in its energy performance. 252 megajoules came out at 0.6 stars. The reason why it was slightly different is the building materials were a little bit better, a little bit stronger, a bit more plasterboard and some fibre cement. Uh, but more importantly, we had this new product that we, we, we actually got CSR into the building industry in the 1930s, which is called Kainite. Kainite was actually a recycled product from our sugarcane industry. Uh, and, uh, and so we took the, the cane fibre, uh, pressed it into, into a board, um, and, uh, and that had some, some insulating properties. And so our, our next CSA house was in 2011. It's built and designed to an eight-star standard. You can see that the, the energy load on this house with, the, with current building practices is about a tenth of my grandfather's house. We worked out that if, if my grandfather's house was still there, unfortunately it got bulldozed for a block of units, but, um, if it was still there, it would be probably costing around about $5,000 a year to heat and cool it to a comfortable level all year round. Um, in these days, of course, we are heating and cooling. We do a lot more. We, we want a lot more comfort than we used to have. So it was only about 40% heating load in the house in, in Sydney now. The next thing we did was we had a look at a. We did a bit of a survey of a European expats, North American and European expats living in Australia, and we asked them what they thought of Australian housing. 70% of them said that they looked terrific, a lot better than the houses that they used to live in in, in North America or Europe. Basically, they say, consistently said, we build really good-looking homes in Australia. Unfortunately, they don't perform very well. So 75% thought the building performance was relatively poor. And the main reason for this was due to poor quality, poor levels of insulation. And then the second and third reasons were, oh, sorry, for poor, poor quality draft um, uh, glazing windows, uh, then insulation and poor quality uh, draft proofing. So they thought they were very leaky. Well, when I moved to Australia, I thought it's going to be pretty similar to what I know from the U.S. In fact, I'm from Florida, and so the climates are pretty similar to what we'd have here in Sydney. But the first winter, it was so cold, it, and it was drafty, and we couldn't get heat into the house. And so the only way I felt like I could get through winter was to sleep with one of these on every night. Coming from France, I had the experience that coming to Australia, I would enjoy the warm climate. climate. Um, Except uh, instead of that, I've never felt as cold as during winter here in Australia. I'd say I'm very surprised by the, uh, the poor quality of the glazing and how big the air gaps are around my windows and my doors. I'm originally from Sussex in the southeast of England, and one of the things that I've noticed since living here is the major condensation problem that builds up on the windows during the winter months. This then leads to the problem of mould, and having to regularly wipe down the windows, the window frames, and also our walls in the house. I am quite surprised by how uh, strong is the noise coming to my house. Even I get doors and windows closed. Um, I live close to, uh, to Main Street, and uh, I guess it's really disturbing. I guess it's the first time in my life where to go to bed and sleep during the night, I have to put ear blocks. Um, I found the, the windows especially, they are really not protecting you from, from the noise. So since we did prepare this uh, for the seminar series, some very interesting new research has been published in, in Lancet, a medical study. Uh, Professor Adrian Barn Barnett from the Queensland University of Technology. He found that uh, compared to Sweden, where they have 3.9% of deaths due to exposure to the cold, in Australia we have 6.5% of our deaths are due to the cold. And his quote was... Many Australian homes are just glorified tents and we expose ourselves to far colder temperatures than the Scandinavians do. This really made us think some more about what we're doing and how we're building uh, our, our houses in particular in Australia. So you know, when you look at it, we, we did always build with a lot, lot of airflow and breeze. We didn't want to close them up. And particularly if you look at the, the warmer climates, we'd build something like these beautiful classic Queenslander colonial uh, homes with uh, a lot of airflow going through. But, you know, things have changed. And one of the things that has changed is that uh, we're now air conditioning or heating our homes to a far greater extent. The air conditioning load across Australia 
it was around 30% only 10, 15 years ago, and now over 75% of homes have an air conditioner in them. This is changing the way we, we live and, and, uh, and, and use our, our homes. So what we've done is turn these homes into basically energy guzzlers, and really that's what has led to the whole energy efficiency provisions in the building code, which, as you know, first came in in 2005 at about three and a half stars for, for the energy code. We then moved to five, and then and now we're at six star. We call this pre-teen, I call this, pre-teen energy codes. Why are they pre-teen? Because we've only really just started. Uh, and one of the things that we... We've, we've done is to look at the energy efficiency, but there's a lot of other issues. And now we are, we are finding that we have to think a lot more about other aspects of, of the building process. And that's come about firstly because of the change in our energy use with air conditioners and heaters and the dynamics of that affecting the way that we, uh, we live in our homes. Secondly, we now have energy efficiency provisions at six star and that's changing the way the dynamics of the house uh, building would be operating. Uh, and thirdly, we've now got, for example, bushfire requirements. Uh, and there's a few other areas where, you know, we make one change and then we've got to think about the implications on others. And a couple of those key implement, uh, in, implications are to do with moisture management, condensation, and with indoor air quality. And that's the experience that North Americans and Europeans had some... 15, 20, 25 years ago when they went through exactly the same process and now they build very, very good quality homes and they don't have as many people die. So our research focus has been about this. Basically, it's about HAM. HAM is heat, air and moisture. And that's what today's seminars are all about. It's about how do we design and build for heat, air and moisture and getting the best performance out of our, out of our buildings. So our learnings have come by a lot of the research we've done through the CSR house. We've had sensors all through the house. We've been monitoring temperature profiles through summer and winter. We've done a lot of design optimization, running various scenarios of design of, of varying orientations and windows and, and installation levels to try to work out how can we get the lowest possible cost to deliver the, the better uh, performance. Uh, we've also done work uh, looking at ventilation rates. We we did something which you couldn't do in a, in, a, in a house which is occupied, which is we filled it completely with smoke uh, and then used our ventilation products trying to work out how long it takes to be able to clear the air through, how, many, how long it takes to have a, a complete air change through the entire house. We've also done work, uh, we've done a co-heating test. Um, for those who aren't aware of it, it's not very commonly done in Australia, more so in the northern climates in America and, and Europe. Co-heating test is where we take close up the entire house. Uh, once again, you can only do this in an in a, in a, uh, unoccupied house. We close it up for two weeks and we, we, pump, uh, we maintain, pump uh, heat into it, maintain it at a fixed temperature and then look at the, measure the amount of energy it took to, to hold that temperature for that period of time. Fundamentally, it is the R value of the house, the entire R value of the house, and it is an actual measurement of the R value, not theoretical. And then when we did, when, we, when we, uh, we, we took the barriers off, we took the opportunity to have a look at the impacts of daylight in terms of window to floor glazing ratios, and we'll hear a bit more about that uh, in the next uh, little while. We've also done a lot of work on climates. The one really key thing for us in trying to uh, manage and build in, uh, in these environments is we've got a very, very broad climate range. Um, we have, of course, at the same time that we've still got 30 degree temperatures up in, in Darwin at the moment. We did uh, this seminar down in Hobart last week and it snowed. <laughs> so, so we do have a broad climate in Australia we have to take account of. And we have the whole range of, uh, of bomb bureau meteorological data uh, in our database and we use that to make sure that whatever we do, whatever we're recommending is, is, is climate specific to the particular local, locality. All of this is aimed at comfort. It's, it's what people are after. So if you look at this, you can see uh, this is the, the actual uh, climatic data uh, throughout uh, the year. This is a whole year's average as to whether or not uh, you are below or above, above or below, what is the climate zone. The climate, comfortable climate zone is basically 22 degrees plus or minus one or two degrees. And so you can see for uh, Melbourne areas that we've got sampled here, 
uh, that the very, very, very small amount of the time, the year, are uh, you actually naturally in a comfortable climatic zone, which means that unless you put up with the cold and, and run the risk of, of the colder exposure, then you have to heat and you apply energy to heat or in summer you're, you're cooling. So we've been doing that kind of analysis, looking at that, looking at, at where people want to go, what the comfort levels are that people uh, are, are after. And that's predominantly the driver. The driver has been the comments that people have made going through our CSR house about how comfortable it is, and, and now we're trying to work out what does it all mean? How do, how do you build a better, more comfortable home? Because, and what we've found is that it is a very close interrelated uh, relationship between all of these features here, the ventilation, the, 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 um, the HVAC systems, the energy use, the zoning, the acoustics, the daylight, they're all interrelated and it is complex and hopefully we can shed a little bit more light on, on some of the uh, outcomes for that. All of this is looking at trying to work out how we design, we build and then live in uh, uh, homes and buildings to be, to be better performing. So our outcomes, it's all about the outcome for that. So we want to get uh, reduced drafts, improved damp resistance, better natural light, daylight, uh, better thermal stability and, of course, lower energy and operating costs. So today there will be three speakers, uh, firstly covering the H or the, ha the, uh, the heat area is Scott Clarkson on Reality Stars, Angus Kell will cover off air with Don't Be Outflanked uh, and Jesse will finish up with Moisture on Know Your Cavity. We'll have a uh, short uh, period of questions after each one, but we will, as I say, have a have a, a good solid question and answer session at the end, followed by some refreshments. So I hope you enjoy the day.